Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Understanding My Will Q&A presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Understanding My Will. Recorded on 11th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Spanish guitars, real good, you know? Okay. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun. Okay. Well, now we come to Understanding My Wheel Q&A, and the very first question was the question that Graham previously asked, which was the question about uh, how do I go about undoing the process? How do I go about exercising my will in a positive direction if I'm not using willpower? Uh, what, what do I do? How, how do I go about doing it? To use your will in a positive direction, there must first be a desire in your soul to do so. Now, that is called an aspiration. It's, a, it's, a, it's not something that's there right now, but it's a feeling for the future that you want. It has to exist. Because if that feeling doesn't exist, you won't do it. So first, first thing you're going to need is an aspiration. So you need to aspire to be loving. That's the very first thing you're going to need. Right. Now, if the aspiration within inside of myself does not exist inside of me to be loving, then there are already a number of things that are occurring in my life that's, that, that are affecting me. And that is, God's trying to show me through the pain that's in my life. Right? So remember that every time you break law, you sin. Every time you sin, there's a law of compens compensatory effect upon the sin. So there's pain. The pain increases. What is the primary motivator for somebody to aspire to be more loving initially is generally an aspiration to avoid their own pain, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because uh, it could be other things that motivate us to change, but for the majority of us, it's just a desire to avoid our own pain that causes us to change. Does that make sense? And that then triggers this sort of aspiration. But it's not an aspiration to be loving, is it? It's just an aspiration to avoid more pain. Right. Now, of course, that's also my definition of pain. Right. So my definition of pain, as we've already talked about, is flawed. So the problem with an aspiration to avoid just avoid pain is that sometimes I'll do take an action that is loving to avoid pain, but other times there's things that I think are not you know like addictions I think are giving me good results, and so unfortunately I won't take actions to avoid them, right? So so that's a, that's a problem. That's usually a person's main motivation the aspiration to avoid pain. What that needs to do is change to be an aspiration to be loving. Now, that is probably only going to be motivated by some level of truth, is it not? So in other words, I need to see, so this, uh, and this is in reverse order. Uh, that I'm polluting these. Does it make sense? Like, that's what we want in order to change. How do we get there? Is the question. So, what I'm going to need before then. So maybe I should put that right down the bottom, just to not confuse matters. Most of us are not very good at reverse Polish. So, so we put this right down here. That that's our end result. The end result is aspire. to be loving. This is what is going to eventually drive us to take action, right? The internal aspiration.
how do we get to this end result? Well, there's lots of ways that you're already being helped to get to that end result. You think about the ways you're being helped to get to that end result. What are those ways? Can we have a look at some of them? Uh, if we go across to Josh down here, and then Glenda down the front, and Cardi there, and David. So Cardi first. If, yep. Josh. Um, we could um, take a look at our past and like take a good observation at it and realise that perhaps there could have been some help to stop us avoiding some of those situations that would have been really, really bad. Okay, so we could measure. Remember, measure, or, or we could even say we would analyse, which is actually the theme, our real life and feelings, couldn't we? Huh? So that might motivate us to have an aspiration. Once we, once we analyse our real life and feelings, we go, actually, a lot of the things that I thought were bringing me happiness, in the end they haven't brought me happiness, so something must be up. And, I need, and, and so maybe I should just experiment with a different way. Could, could be enough to create the aspiration. Does that make sense? Just understanding that truth. Or we analyse our life and go, wow, well, you know, if I look at my life, I have hurt a lot of people in my past. Like I can see I've hurt a lot of people in the past and I don't really feel good about that. So that could create the aspiration. Right? Or we might hear some, what you've been hearing for six years. What's that? Or eight years or whatever. You might hear some truth. And this truth, go, you go, oh, I've never thought of things that way before. Maybe it's worth experimenting with that. And that could create the aspiration. Right, Ex just the experimentation or search for truth could create it. Yep. Yep. Here we go, Alex. Um, I, I thought one of the things really driving me is just exhaustion and tiredness. Yeah, but that's just pain. Yeah, okay. So, and what I'm suggesting to you is the avoidance of pain is not necessarily going to help you have an aspiration. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because, because it's your measure of pain. And your pain sometimes is actually God's pleasure. <laughs> like, for most of you, having an addiction met is your pleasure. Uh, and, and that's like pain from the perspective of God. Uh, you're creating pain. Right? And then not having an addiction met for many of you is your pain. But that's God's pleasure. <laughs> he doesn't want your addiction to be met. Right? He wants you to choose differently. So, so you've got to be careful about just being motivated by your own pain, whether it be exhaustion or any other thing. You've got to be careful because in the end it's your assessment of pain and your assessment of pleasure that drives the problem, that drives the behaviour then. Oh, I mean a, like a sickness of, of addiction, like just over it. You, know? you can see how bad it is, what's causing, what it's doing. Yeah, see, see, to me that that wouldn't be exhaustion then, though, Alex. Oh, I just meant like a sick. I'm sick and tired of it. That's what I mean. Yeah, but I wouldn't have that feeling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the feeling I would have is I would have a desperate desire to never engage it anymore. That's different to just feeling exhausted. Do you understand? An exhaustion feeling comes from an anger. Uh, remember, I said that earlier. It, it's a, it's the it's the passive aggressiveness. That, that is being expressed when you get exhausted. That's all it is. I did all these things my way and it didn't work out. Now I'm just exhausted and I, I don't do anything or I don't feel like doing anything. Right? This is an expression of anger, not, not actually real desire. Do you follow? Mm. And it's just a tantrum in the end. It's not, it's not going to motivate you. I can guarantee you it will not motivate you to change. It won't. No, oh, I can feel like I've, I've got a desire to love as well. <laughs> it's interesting where you went in that conversation, Alex. Well, I had an experience yesterday. You cannot yeah. listen to anything from me that confronts you emotionally in any way at this stage. You always want to justify yourself 
in every conversation. You want to believe things about yourself that are not true and you want to justify it in every conversation. And what I'm suggesting to you is that is an indication that you're driven by addiction, not by anything else. Does that make sense? You've just got to be very careful of this. Oh, but it's this. Oh, but it's that. No, but it's this. No, you said the right things. You said what you said and you said it right. It was an expression of your soul's feeling. I'm just saying to you, it's not going to motivate you. you. You said it right. You don't have to try another way of saying things. You said it right at the beginning. It's exactly how you feel. You do feel exhausted. But that I'm saying to you, that will not drive you in the end to become more loving. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? David, down in the front here. Oh, sorry, Cardi, far away. Oh, I think that I've um, not heard your question my question was how do I go about changing my will in a positive direction that was that was the question that Graham asked because he, he's concerned that he's got all this sin inside of him desire to do the wrong thing and he, and he can't will pay power his way out of it which most of you have tried and it doesn't work right so 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 you can't willpower your way out of it how are you going to change it and this is what I'm saying. There are certain things that you can choose to do through the exercise of your own will that will actually cause the thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations and faith and action inside of you to build. And as they build, motivation will occur naturally. But if you continue to attack it, and at the moment for Graham, a lot of it's getting attacked through doubt, you know, the, the desire to doubt. Doubt God, doubt God's truth, doubt God's goodness. You know, doubt all of these things about God really in the long run. And that's and while you're feeding that particular thing, then it's hard for desire to build because that because doubt is is the choice to not act, basically. Doubt doubt is great to help us to not do something. And 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 so you can undo the choice to doubt for, for in Graham's case. But for other for others it's different emotions. It's some, for many of you, it's just you want your addictions met and that's it. Right? Without measuring the results. Now, if you analysed uh, your real life and feelings and measured the results of your addictions, what would you find? Oh, they're causing me lots of pain, actually. They've caused a lot of pain in my life to myself and other people. There's a good motivator if I analyse it and, and have an accurate reflection of my life. Now I might be motivated to do something to change. David? Um, well, ha having yourself sort of demonstrating it to us, I thought would be one thing, and, and being aware of that, seeing sort of love in action. Okay, so to be inspired. And the other thing I was thinking is another way. Um, was you know be becoming aware of God's laws and experimenting with them. You know, that's what I've found when I've you know have a desire and engage that. I've found you know inspiration from that. Um, yeah, it's really about seeking truth. That is like mm. having a, just a desire to know what the truth is, and mm. to, that can motivate you. That's what motivated me. That one. That's the, uh, the main thing that's motivated me most of my life. Just a desire to know the more more truth. You know, because uh, and, and now I see the benefit of knowing more truth. But that's after years of having a desire to know more truth and discovering it and so forth. In the beginning, I just wanted to know the truth because the whole world seemed to not know any truth. <laughs> I, I didn't want to live like that, you know, for the rest of my life. I was too inquisitive to know the truth and then put up with that. So, and, and I could see everyone just foundering around in their life, you know, going from here to there because they didn't know what the truth was and why certain things were happening. So this was, this was my biggest thing. Is to want to know the truth, just wanting to know, and wanting to know above all things whether whether I was in pain or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you raise the other issue of being inspired. There's lots of ways we are inspired. Our spirit friends try to inspire us. You come to these kind of sessions. You try. You is a, is a way of inspiring you. Thoughts are dropped into your mind from all sorts of sources that are all positive. God's trying to inspire you through the operation of God's laws. So there's all sorts of areas where you can be inspired to actually you know, get to this stage, to have an aspiration from within oneself. So, so up until this stage, 
All of these things can help you in the end have an aspiration. Right? Now, it's just a matter of which one is going to help you have the aspiration. Really, that's what it really gets down to. And my suggestion is to, and there's more, obviously, than these, isn't there? Like, like imagine if uh, all of a sudden you had a celestial spirit appear right in front of you here. What would you think then? Well, you, you, you'd probably feel some level of truth about what's being discussed, would you? Yeah. Yep. But of course that's not going to happen. Do you know why? We don't want it. Well, well, it can't actually happen at this point. It could happen sometime in the future, but only after you have the faith that it can happen. <laughs> do you understand? They, they can't do something that would cause your faith to grow without the faith growing from within you. It has to happen within you first. So it's not going to happen until it happens within you. So when all of you believe that can actually happen and you all feel it's going to happen and you all desire it to happen, then it will happen. Which might be helpful, but only to other people. <laughs> because by that stage you've sorted yourself out. Right? <laughs> yeah. Any others that you can think of, uh, Joy, straight behind? Um, to me, imagination is important. Like, if I really really know what's truly going on with myself and I'm seeking truth and, that, and then I get inspired, like the other day when you spoke to us about the possibility of what can happen for mankind if we choose right action and become more loving. Um, yeah, I've got a problem with imagination, though in terms of uh, how it's applied i feel i feel it's more to do with faith than imagination because to me imagination you could imagine things that are actually wrong or you could it's like hope you could have imagination that's wrong or hope that's wrong or hope that's true or imagination that's true um so i don't know how inspiring in the long run it's going to be to me, what builds me, my action is having faith, which is more, not to do with imagination. It's to do with the past results of my own experiments proving to me the future results are possible. And that's a, to me, that's a different thing um, than imagination. Mm. Yep. Uh, if we come down to Monique. <coughs> um. Um, feeling about the effect on others um, and whether that's from guides or um, praying for God's yep. truth and actually feeling about the sin then inspires change? Yep. I, I don't know. Like, Can I put it this way? Can I put yep. it this way? Associations. Who you associate with has a large bearing on your aspiration in the end. So if, I, if you, for instance, Graham, you went down to a place where there's just only a heap of guys who all had similar injury to you and all they've decided to do was that they were just going to have sex, you know, and they were just going to make up sexual things, activities for each day, and that's all they're going to do, and you decided that you were going to associate with them. Can you see that? given some emotional injuries, in the end it might turn out that you're exactly like them. Right? But then if you, have, if you have a whole heap of people who really want to change and really want to grow in love and really want to um, you know, work through their emotional injuries and, they all, and a lot of them have uh, relationships with their soulmates like, you know, and you see the benefit of having a relationship with your soulmate rather than doing those other things and you associate with them, can you see that might inspire you? To, to actually make the personal choice to be loving as well. Yeah? So if we come back to Graham. Sorry, Graham, it is over there. Yep. Um, I think one thing that works for me is my um, interactions with you. Yeah. Um, I've seen how loving you are, and to me, even when it's pretty hard to handle. Yeah. Um, but I do see the the love from you, and 
you know, I don't, I've got to be honest and say, I don't know whether you're Jesus, yep. but I do know that you're in a much better condition than I am. Yep. So and that, I want that. So that's example, isn't it? Yeah. So someone's example will. will yeah, cause I you want to, what you've got. Yeah. So the desire to. You see what somebody else has got, you go, oh, I'd really like to have that. And their example demonstrates what you would like. So that's another thing that can cause an aspiration. Yeah, very good. Yep, straight back to Natalie. So what about if you start to see your sin and see the effects that it's having on people? Well, that can also have a good, good motivation too, can it? That's part of analysing our real okay. life and feelings, isn't it? Seeing the results of what's really going on in your life and seeing the negative effects, actually seeing the negative effects on other people as well as ourselves and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So can you see, uh, so in answer to your question, Graham, and maybe if you pass the mic back to Graham, so in answer to your question, you can see that there's a number of things that may in the end cause you to have the aspiration to be loving. Now, once you've got an aspiration to be loving in your soul, then you'll probably engage in thoughts, emotions, desires, You'll probably want to develop some faith, take some action. You'll probably spend some more time with people who have similar aspirations and so forth. And this will help the aspiration build. Does that make sense? But, but it does come from within your soul. It's not, you can't willpower yourself through it. You can't just force it. It has to actually be a real thing that gets developed from within this aspiration, this feeling. And... It can start as just the tiniest little seed, can it? And it just you just have to treat it like uh, like a seed in your garden. You know, you c if you try too hard and overwater it, you kill it. If you try to add too much fertilizer, you kill it. Yeah, you, you have to have patience and just allow it to grow and feed it with the right little things. Yes, and and when you say allow it to grow, you've got to sustain its growth is probably the best way of putting it, isn't it? So, so you know that if with a seed, if you don't water it, it's going to die. So, so the same applies to your aspiration. You've got to water it. You've got to supply. And if you don't feed the, you know, if it's growing in a, in a, in a mineral deficient soil and you don't adjust that, you know it's going to die as well. So the same goes with your aspiration. You've got to feed it with the right things. Exactly the things that Mary talked to you about two years ago in, in those presentations is the things you need to do in order to build this aspiration. But the aspiration doesn't, is not, can't be willpowered your way through. It has to come up from within you. You can't lean over this seed and go, grow. Exactly. That's what many of you have tried doing, right? Yeah. And it doesn't work, does it? The seed's going to grow if you give it the right environment, is basically what we're saying. And what I'm suggesting is, here's the right environment for creating aspirations. Many of us destroy our aspiration because we we're not involved in the right environment. You know, the time, people we spend time with, a negative. The, the, the examples we look to are negative. Like many of us look to examples of, I want the money that that person has, or I want, you know, the seeming life and, uh, of, of um, you know, wealth that that person has, or whatever. We have aspiration, you know, and so that's what we set as our example, right? Many of us uh, don't seek for the truth, you know, so we only want, you know, we only want to hear the truth if it's going to benefit us, and if it doesn't seemingly benefit us, we go, no, I don't want to hear that, you know. So, so there are a whole heap of things we can choose to squash the aspiration as well. But the aspiration has to come from the soul if it's going to benefit. Okay, so we have, we have some little seed of aspiration to be loving. Yep. Um, and w we provide the environment, which is all those things there. Um, and then we've got to have patience. Uh, you've got to have desire as well as patience. That's one of the things we have there, though, isn't it? Exactly. exactly. Because you can't just have patience and do nothing, can you? It's like yeah, but the desire is part of the environment. <laughs> yes. So as long as you have a sustainable environment for the aspiration to grow, then of course your aspiration will continue to grow. And desire is part of that environment. Correct. Okay. Yep. So, so, and these things are part of that environment too. Yeah, yeah. Right? I see many making mistakes here. You know, they still keep associating with people who pull them down all the time, for example. And so then their aspiration gets squashed every time. 
And that can be family. And often it is family, yeah. Often, frequently, it is family. And, uh, and like with the example thing that you raised, Graham, uh, you know, we can, we can watch what a person has, but frequently we don't believe them when they say how they got it. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, we, and the, so, so when you see a person w just demonstrating an example to you, the key is to have a little bit of trust about how they got there. But as you know, trust is one of your major emotional injuries. So you can see straight away that actually if I work on this trust issue, that it's going to help my aspirations quite a lot. You follow? Because then I can copy what that person's saying to do and, and maybe receive the same benefits. At this stage, you're not motivated to copy because you're not sure whether you can trust the person. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so this also helps you identify the sin-based emotional injuries that exist within us and to see which one is having the greatest impact on our life right now. So the trust issue is probably having the greatest impact on your life right now. So my suggestion is, if you do have an aspiration, work on that particular emotional injury first. Does that make sense? Because it's going to have the biggest benefit to you in the long run. Yeah. So what I, what I try to do myself in my personal analysis is I try to look at what is going to have the biggest benefit to me right now in my own progression. That, that helps me a lot to, pro, to grow. And I do exactly the same when, when we're in discussion with Mary as well. Like we're both focused on well, what's the biggest issue we're facing right now? Because it, that's the issue that's going to give me the biggest amount of growth right now if I can address it. So, so that's about not being afraid of how big the issues are, isn't it? It's about feeling like, well, it doesn't matter how big or small the issues are, if it's affecting me right now and it's the thing stopping my next stage, then that's the thing for me to address. But again, that's an exercise of my will. Yep. So can you see how the aspiration sort of builds you can nurture it just like you good illustration of a seed you know you can nurture it you can overdo you can pressure it which is not going to be good for it you can nurture it by creating the right environment yep but you can also destroy it by creating the wrong environment mm. yep. or by living continuing to live in the wrong environment yep. so what i see uh, many many years ago um, probably 2000 and uh, uh, probably uh, I think it was 2009 or 8 I gave a talk about um, creating a soul space for your soul to thrive and it never got recorded it was uh, in Brisbane some of you might have been there but um, I feel this is what many of us neglect we neglect creating a space where our soul can thrive where our aspirations can thrive we spend time with people who are just pulling down our aspirations all the time you know, making it really hard for us to engage our aspirations. Um, we, spend, we spend our effort in a lot of mundane activities that really stop us from having aspiration. Does that make sense? Or suppress our aspiration. So, you know, part, a part of grow, any growth is to create the environment for growth. And sometimes that, you know, for my, in my case, I had to remove myself from pretty much everybody to, in order to create a space where I was, felt like I was allowed to grow, right? But for some of you, you've already done that because you prefer that. So you'd be better off spending time with people rather than removing yourself. Does that make sense? Because it, you know, it just depends on what, what, what's going on for you as to what you need to choose to do to create a space that's going to assist your growth. And that doesn't mean you're reliant on other people or anything. It just means that you're, you're conscious of this little tiny seed of aspiration inside of yourself. You're conscious of how important that particular feeling is. And it's got to be nurtured. It's got to be helped. It's got to be grown. It's got to be, you know, that's the thing I, I want to protect my aspiration to become more loving. Mm. If you do that, you're using your will to love. You, you now, now that this aspiration is there, the, the aspiration itself will drive your future development then. And then you're less reliant on these external factors. So once that seed <coughs> grows into something a little bit bigger, yep. then I can have 
an aspiration to be loving to myself by seeing the pain that my addictions cause me. Yep. And once I can see the pain that my addictions cause me, then I can have the will to challenge to my addiction. Correct. So that this is how the aspiration to challenge your addictions begins. Does that make sense? And basically, unless there's an aspiration on pretty much every subject we've discussed, y you, you will eventually stagnate in your growth. So what you eventually do is you have an aspiration in all sorts of areas of your life to grow this area and that area and this area and that area. And after a while, you're able to also cope with more emotion. So that means that you're able to cope with two or three things happening in the week where you've had to cry about three different things or five different things in the week without you getting all stressed about it and worried about it and we're, or without you having to share with everybody else in the world that it happened, you know? And so, yeah, it's a, it's a growing process. And this is why, like all the pageant messages say, there's no such thing as instant change, right? And, and many new age people want there to be. Like, that's what I've noticed. Many people who are in the New Age movement or come from the New Age movement have wanted there to be. And there's many examples in the New Age movement of instant change, which is just spirit overcloaking, whereas spirits just overcloak the person and they're a different person. And, and that's not the kind of change you want. So we've got to be careful of wishful thinking. Yes. So we've got to make sure it's real. God wants it to be real. Like I get the feeling that Fast change can happen, but it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back. You might see some fast change happening, but really you've, you've ignored all the previous straws that have been piled up and piled up and piled up until something gives and then, then something happens, seems to happen quickly. Yes. It was really a long, slow process. Correct. And, and, and this is what a lot of people do because we're not me accurately measuring our life most of the time. We can't see the little changes we're making, but after a while you become very sensitive to the little changes that are being made. So, so, so even when my life hasn't significantly changed, so I'm working through some fairly hard emotions at this stage, and so you know, there's not a huge external changes in my life that are going on at this stage, but, but I can feel every little change is just adding up to, in the end, I'll get, I'll get to that point where these particular emotions have gone, you know what I mean? And so, so, so I'm not easily swayed from the process as a result of that. Because after a while you get so sensitive emotionally that you can measure each change. You can feel the change within you. Yeah. Which is really good then. Yeah. It's a good, good question. Okay, Paul, if we can have up the back there. Uh, I'm struggling with a bit of tiredness uh, today and I'm wondering, and I've noticed a few others as well, whether that's um, what you feel like like's going on there. Well, it, again, it, remember when we're tired, it's the, exos the soul is exercising its resistance now. Right? So, so usually it's a resistance to our emotions. So there's some emotions getting triggered in this conversation, which then cause us to want to shut down. Now, if you think about this morning, um, I've, I've said a number of confronting things already in the first discussion, haven't I, about the soul being the whole soul, not the t individual halves, and things like that, which, which there was a definite, right, major negative reaction <laughs> in the audience, right? So, so, you know, that's an indication that there is this feeling in many of you that you wish that everything was just dependent upon you and you alone, right? And not there's no other influences or, or circumstances that you need to consider. Or many of you wish that you have the choice of who your other half is. You, you want you, it to be your choice, right? On the soul level, that's what you want. You want it to be your choice. You don't, and you see what I'm talking about is almost things getting forced upon you. Is, is what the feeling that many of you have. Whereas I sort of see it as, no, this is my soul, <laughs> my soul's will, right? I know that if I engage my soul, collective, will, then I'm, I'm in, on the right stream to finding the other half of me pretty quick. So to me, that's a good thing. For many of you, that's a bad thing. 
Right. So, you know, there's a suppression of that as well going on emotionally. And then we've started talking about how you change your will. And for many of you, it's, to, it, it's feeling like, oh, hang on a sec, like I, I'm confused about willpower, effort. What do I do? How do I do it now? Right. And many of you, when you enter this state of confusion, not, you're not realizing that actually your soul has already been exercising its will negatively. And you just don't want to come face to face with the fact that you have. You've been making choices to influence your soul's will negatively. And, and, and that this aspiration has to be from within you. And then that's when you start feeling hopeless. You go, well, I don't have one within me. Like, what do I do about that? Well, I've already told you what to do about it. If you really wanted to do something about it, you would. But many of you feel quite like you don't really know if you really want to and that's okay sooner or later i'm sure you'll decide to even if the later it happens to be a thousand years later sooner or later something will happen but for many of you um, and this is something i want to discuss with you in the next talk many of you pain is the primary motivator right and that that is a it is an issue in itself because it as, as soon as you stop the pain from your perspective, you'll stop. And unfortunately, your definition of pain often is God's definition of pleasure and vice versa. So we've got issues there that we need to face as well. So there's quite a lot of confronting information, Paul, that's being presented today. And this is what causes people to feel like, oh, I just want to zone out now and go home and relax. And, you know, it's all too much now. But it's actually it's, it's interesting, the feeling you have as a group is very interesting because the previous group felt actually more inspired by this day. And many of you are feeling less inspired today. Right? So there's an indication there that um, you know, it's just different emotions that cause the lack of inspiration and therefore the exhaustion and tiredness and everything else yeah. <laughs> for those on the video there's a lovely gurgle going on in the background there <laughs> yeah. okay does that help Paul does that help with why yeah. yeah can you feel that yeah, yeah. what what things in for yourself triggered you do you feel emotionally today I'm not really sure. I don't know. When did it? When did the tiredness begin? Well, I, I, I arrived sort of a bit angry and sad and stuff. So, so already suppressing some emotion. Yeah, and and sort of connecting he, here and there with it with it as well. So, so so I'm not sure, but you know, the the soulmate thing's pretty big, and um, you know, you know, a lot of this stuff comes back to, you know, like, do we really want it? You know, so that's a pretty big. Yeah. Question, you know, and and um, another thing that confronted you was my discussion with uh, I think it was Claudia about spirit interaction and thinking it's God and things like oh, that. That yeah. was quite confronting for you as well. Yeah, well, it was. I was telling myself that now I'm connecting to God. I think you know because well, this is what I felt is that is that when I focus on God, I feel a little bit like if I'm in your company that I'm quite challenged straight up. And, and, and my thoughts are, if I'm pretty challenged, well, that, that's probably God, because it's like I'm not having myself on here. It's like this is pretty hard to be present here. Yeah. So, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Which is probably true, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so, so I don't really know <laughs> exactly So can you see, though, you arrived in a state where you weren't feeling your sadness? So you're yep. getting angry instead. Yep. That doesn't help, right? That's going to attract spirits around you as well in oh, that state. Yep. Right. So, so not feeling emotion attracts some spirits as yep. well, suppressing yep. the emotion. Yep. Then you hear a series of things that are quite confronting. Yeah. Right. To your own personal life and so forth. Yeah. So that that then there's the confrontation, and and there's the like. And the, and the feeling is that you're not in, you don't enjoy the confrontation of truth. 
you're not enjoying truth. And there's very few people actually yet that actually enjoy truth. Actually, that's what I've noticed. Um, um, none, not many of you would know Nicky, right, over in the UK. Well, when he has a conversation with me, he just really enjoys how you know the truth no matter how confronted he is at the end like he's just he's just so enthusiastic for it he's a person who really loves enjoys the truth mary really enjoys it tristan my son tristan really enjoys it eloisa litton hitchens she really enjoys the truth um so there's a few uh people around that do really enjoy the truth but it's very rare still to find a person who really enjoys having a truthful and honest conversation and and this is uh, something to aspire to you know to be around those kind of people and and what is it that causes them to just want to know all this truth all the time even though it's really hard for them and and for, for many of them they have to go home and cry for weeks on end to, <laughs> afterwards what, what causes them to have that level of desire for it you know because that's the kind of uh, thing in the end that you'd like to have, isn't it? Like that level of desire for truth. You think the more thirsty you are for truth and the more open you are to receiving it, the more rapidly you can receive it. So that would be fantastic. So whereas uh, the feeling I get with yourself, Paul, is that, yep, that, that thirst is not there yet. Yep. And, and to be honest with the whole group, the only reason why a thirst generally is not there yet is because of our, our addictions. Our desire to maintain our facade and so forth. That's usually the reason why. So we can go back to that as to what's going on for those in those areas. Still wanting the addictions. Yep, yep. Because a lot of what I've said today confronts a lot of our addictions, doesn't it, if you think about it, so... It's kind of our addiction even to be a free-thinking, free-feeling person on our own right without anybody else's emotion being involved. Even that, from what I've just said, is not possible. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. If we come down to Glenda. So the last question, Glenda, so... It's not really a question, it's a comment. Yep, I just, comment. just want to say that this hour has been probably the most helpful for me so far. That's good, yeah. Yeah, because it helps you understand how to change an aspiration. I don't know how to build a desire for something that's not there. Yeah, most people have the same problem. And, and this is how you do it. Yeah, to build a desire for something that's not there. Yep. And, and you know that if the desire's not there, it's not going to happen, right? You know that. So you can, we can be talking for the next 20 years, and if, if the aspiration doesn't change inside of you, it's not, nothing's going to really change. We'll be talking about the same things in 20 years' time. This is what has to change. And, and frank, frankly, for the majority of people, it does take them five to ten years before that they realise that, when they hear God's truth. The average person does take five to ten years before they realise how important it is to build aspirations that are not there and, and what kind of action needs to be taken in order to build aspiration. What, what kind of thing needs to be done. Yeah, so good discussion. Both uh, this group and the Ask group are, are very different to each other, you'll find, actually. And, uh, and so when we do finish up doing the recordings, um, I'm pretty sure you'll find that it's good to watch both of them because you'll see a, a fairly... Like there's almost, there's, there's a lot of information I missed out in the last one that we've presented this one and vice versa. So, so it means that, you know, together they should perform, be a good library of what, what can be done to develop your will to love. Yeah. All right, well, let's have our 20-minute uh, break now. Could we come back at five past two? Um, because we've still got that pain versus pleasure to talk about.